placemaking at its core is about focusing on the human dimensions of any neighbourhood, city or town. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the only people usually left out of the process of making new developments are the end users. Everyone's (laughs) running around designing, but no one's talking to the most important people, which are the people that actually will generate the community and hand it over and be the custodians of that place long after we all leave. Right. So yeah, here, here. we often we often as Irico become the sound and the voice of that end user, the persona and the person. It's a really important role. It's one that I really um, cherish and it's one that I will often lose a client for. I'll stand up for the human before I stand up for the client. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. As the show has progressed over the past few years, we've often touched on topics like regenerative agriculture, building mindful communities, and even living more intentionally with circular communities that boast their own foraging and gardening spaces, and with more shared spaces, bettering the hippie communities of yesterday and even one that I grew up in. We've covered the fact that people in big cities have a lower carbon footprint per capita than most who live outside of cities. We've talked about infrastructure changes needed and what it might take to build back better. Each week, I work to provide solutions to the challenges that we face, to expose the issues, but also to share the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a lot of work, but I have to tell you, when I see reviews like this one from Elena Gardens on Apple, oh, well, Apple Podcasts or iTunes, as some of you know it, I have to say it makes it all worth it. She says, I love this podcast. It is the encouragement I need right now to continue to try to make a difference, and it is so incredibly positive versus most topics on climate. I consider all of the kind words that Elena has to share very high praise. I hope to continue to embody that message so that now we're embarking on a journey together, a deep dive into systems and change. It might just take us a few episodes to do that, maybe even more. But first, we're going to start with a discussion about regenerative food cultivation and supply. And then we're going to pivot into a deeper conversation about community building, city living, and ushering in a new era of modern living. I'm honored to be joined by a master of many domains today as we wander through these figurative gardens and cityscapes, Stephen Cornwell. Stephen is the global director of Irico, who presently resides in New York City. Irico is a global place brand specializing in data science, research and insight, user strategy, urban systems, and brand experience. Stephen Cornwell, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Excited to now, be here. Yeah, me too. Um, we've had to reschedule this a couple of times due to your yes. vast traveling escapades around the globe, working oh, to put this important message into the world. Totally. And I understand you're now actually coming in from upstate New York. How Most- are things up there? I'm upstate. Well, we just had a huge storm here. If there was ever a sort of an indication that the planet's changing its tone in terms of temperature, we're getting tornadoes here, which we've never had before. And we've had two this two in the last two weeks. So, so it's rough up here, but it's a great city. New York City is a great city and upstate's even better. Yeah. Well, I think I've set the stage for really the conversation we're going to have today. I had really never heard that term before, this global place brand, before you and I started this discussion. And I think we could even bridge that into discussion on climate change too. But um, what does global place brand really mean? Well, I think, you know, in our last conversation, placemaking is really at the core of what we do, which is really bridging the, the, putting the gap, bridging the gap between, say, the artifact of architecture, the making of buildings, Mm. and the ecosystem itself. Uh, For the longest time, cities have been building buildings with little care for the humans, 
And what Irico does is really focus on the humans. And so part of that, of course, is branding and positioning. I think a lot of developers think that positioning happens in marketing at the end. And actually, people have choices about where they put their money, where they grow their families, where they build their lives. And we have to actually differentiate these places and actually provide better places to live. There was a, for the longest time, developers in cities have been using it like the stock market. You know, investing in, uh, in buildings. I think 50% of the tall towers in New York City are empty. They've been, they've been parked as just really stock market. Um, and so Irico is really here to bridge the gap between what developers do in terms of, you know, the capitalist side of making buildings and the really the ecosystem side of providing better, uh, better places to live and really hopefully uh, better outcomes for the planet. That's what we do. And our positioning is advancing humanity. I mean, anything that we do has to have that at the core of it. Well, one of the things that we've confronted here on the West Coast and many of our, let's just say, spots that are in high demand, like San Francisco or even my hometown area of Santa Cruz County, um, you know, real estate is in high demand Mm -hmm. and it's very hard to afford the real estate. You know, somebody will say, well, you know, yeah, you can apply to rent this apartment, but you need to make three times what the rent is and be able to cover first, last deposit. And that ends up being an investment of, in many cases, $15,000 just to move in. So I would love to know your thoughts about how, as we tackle this system, we can create affordable choices for people so that we don't see the same present rise in homelessness Mm -hmm. and this constant kind of buck passing where we just aren't taking accountability for the problems that we've seen that are essentially being created in some ways by modern living. Yeah, I think the economics uh, are always difficult, but I think ultimately it's a cultural issue as much as an economic issue, which is we've been bred and you, I think you're a Gen Xer as well, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah, probably been, 46, yes. Yes, we've been raised. Uh, I didn't want to uh, disclose your age, of course. But we've been... We've I'm been, not shy it's about fun. it. It's fun. <laughs> but we were, you know, we were raised at a time where it was all about owning a home, being successful, living in the city, and investing in one's, uh, putting one's money into their primary residence. So culturally what's happened is that all of that's become really a space for the super elite and wealthy. And there's a lot of disenfranchisement with younger people. But the reality is, certainly in America, we've never had a huge renting sharing culture like other parts of Europe. There are, when we work, we work across the globe. So we work in the Middle East, we work in London, we work in, and and we work in Europe. And the, the differences in culture in other parts of the world, say Copenhagen or Amsterdam or any of those other, other European cities that are actually doing better um, with resiliency than most other cities, culturally people are renting and sharing everything. They're not trying to own everything and they're happier for it. So we talk a lot about affordability and it is a challenge in New York City in particular and, of course, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, but the culture's changing. And developers are changing the way they think about build, building buildings. They're developing sharing communities, sharing um, share homes. They're developing now affordable product to tackle the new culture. We're in a very difficult time because all the developers we work with have had the same kind of business model to how they make money on buildings for the last 100 years. None of that works anymore because culturally people can't afford to buy homes. My children won't be able to afford to buy a home. And they're thinking about their investments and the way they think about their lives very, very differently. So I think there's been a really, it's been a slow gain in developers understanding what's happening culturally with younger people and with anyone actually in a city. And I think the community is way ahead of what their needs are compared to cities and and architects and designers and even planners, city planners. So I think we've got a cultural change to happen for sure. And, you know, we don't stack buildings the way we used to. We don't create communities the way we used to. We have to think about shared communities, resiliency. You know, (laughs) New York City is an overpopulated city. You know, one of the great challenges of urbanism is overpopulation. It leads to things like inequity. It leads to affordability issues. It leads to housing crisis. All of this is a symptom 
of just a change in culture that hasn't been met. So it's an old frame. I did a um, I did a presentation at uh, in Melbourne, Australia, about three years ago, and the topic was that I presented was place faking, and it was this idea that we had this utopian idea about what placemaking could do for the world, but really no one was paying attention to all the dramatic changes that were happening. And we think of cities like New York or even Los Angeles as being impervious to ruin or impervious to crumble. And I did a research piece that basically showed that there's a reason that Cairo was one of the greatest wealthy powers in the world turned into a third world country. And a lot of, and a lot of the principles of that, their demise were what we're seeing in New York now. Poor infrastructure, poor affordability, inequity, you know, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, a larger gap of, socio, of social sort of disruption. And, and of course, um, climate change, which really... The weather shift. They used to have many... They used to, it used to be green. <laughs> it used to be the economic power of the world. It used to be the wealthiest. It used to be the most powerful, the most innovative in many, many ways. And it was looted by the Romans. It, it fell over because of its lack of ability to, to, to deal with its population and infrastructure and, of course, affordability. And it, it, became, it became one of the great disasters that happened over a 1,000 years. We don't know that distance. And so we don't think about the fact that New York could one day not be New York City, right? If, if it does flood, which, it, which we're doing everything we can not to let it, that happen. But when the Nile was, was um, uh, changed its, its, its structure, it flooded. Um, and so when it was dammed, uh, it flooded most of the city. And, you know, those things have caused, caused places like Cairo, that was a superpower of the world, to become a ruin, almost a third world country today, a city today. I don't think that's out of the realms of possibility for places like New York City. We can't see it today, but we have this terrible short-term view of everything. Everything we work on together, and we'll get to this a bit later around agriculture because it really is part of that story, is that we have a very short we have a very short term view of everything. We're trying to fix everything today. Politics gets in the way of everything because it's a short four year term, and so we can't see the wood. For, we can't see the. Well, we're hell bent on making things a partisan issue, and when you make are. something like. Uh, well, the structure of how we build homes, a partisan issue, then suddenly it, you're you're eroding what the American dream is. How dare you, right? Yeah, and well, you... I can just picture the conversations that erupt from this. Mm -hmm. So before we talk more about the structure of these cities, because I really intend to dive deeply into that with you with part two of mm -hmm. this whole conversation, I would just like our audience to get to know you a little bit and what brought you to this point, because you have such an eclectic background yeah. and you've combined so many <laughs> different yeah. things to, to yeah. make this whole dream come together. And sure. it's, it's the first thing? time, I'm just going to say this, but it's the first time I've heard from someone like yourself that seems to have really kind of seen the forest through the trees mm -hmm. and built a structure that can actually change the way we're looking at things. So let's let's learn a little bit about what makes Stephen sure. Cornwell Stephen Cornwell. I, I I grew up. I'm obviously not American, so I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, and I went to design school. Like most budding designers, thought I was going to change the world, and that of course was exciting. Uh, when I graduated in '92, that's showing my age. Uh, there was a global recession happening. Now, I think the recession we had to have was what they were calling it at the time. And I found myself kind of rolled into design and branding and marketing, but in around architecture um, and a lot to do with architecture. And we became very famous. My, my wife and I started the business together. I met Jane at, at design school. And uh, we really became sort of a, a brand of choice for architects. And so I fell in love with architecture. And I loved everything that architecture could offer the world in terms of public realm built spaces. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then found myself in a strange, strange way doing a lot of real estate marketing, which I found awful <laughs> because it was all sales oriented. It wasn't about the humans. It was about how much can we extract from this process? And that disenfranchised me. I actually then sold the business in 2012. Um, after doing quite a lot of real estate marketing, we were working around the globe um, on some big projects in London in particular. 
Embassy Gardens, which was a huge development on last piece of Zone 1 land in London, actually, on the South Bank. And in Hawaii, we were doing a 60-acre project called Board Village, which we had branded and we were doing the vision for. And when I sold the company, uh, Howard Hughes Corporation in, in America, who was my client on, in Hawaii and in, um, in uh, New York City, uh, asked me to come and be the chief marketing officer for them uh, and their creative director in New York City. And I really jumped at the chance because as a consultant, you don't ever get into the boardroom to see how decisions get made. And so I got a second education really on how debt financing works, the problems and the challenges with getting approvals, the notion of the politics of projects, community engagement, um, really great community engagement, both at Water Village in Hawaii and in New York City. And after many years there, I decided that I'd take the show on the road. And, you know, I felt that we had had enough experience both on the client side and in the consulting world in sort of understanding the problems, the gaps that existed. I was having a <laughs> having a martini. That's when we used to go out. Remember that? It's great. <laughs> having a martini um, with uh, the global CEO of Woods Baggett, big architecture business. He was complaining about client briefs, and I was complaining about architects. And and and, and I said, architects don't understand the human side of building. And and he was saying, well, clients don't brief very well. And mm. he was right. He was right. Clients' briefs are terrible and they've got to get better. So I said, let's start a business, a global business that actually can start to bridge the gap between what architecture is there to do and what really humans need and try and get the operational side of it, the experience side of it right. So I, always, I find actually when you brief architects with a, bit more, with a few more parameters, you often get a better result. You get a better result for the community and you get a bit better result for the humans and you get a better result for the developer. So well, imagine we, that. Imagine I have a few examples that I can kind of draw from and just in my experience traveling the world, and I'm sure you've seen some of these things too, but you have a, a, a problem in a city and let's just say homeless people are peeing in the streets, mm. okay? Yeah. So all the alleyways stink. Well, what do they do um, just outside of Paris and in some of the arrondissements there? They build these trough-like urinals that are all shrouded in cement and that are kind of almost like an art installation. Mm -hmm. And people go in, they are shielded from the outer world and they can go ahead and urinate in mm -hmm. seemingly public, you know, and we don't have the same smell problem yeah. that we had before. Yeah. And it's kind of integrated into what, what it would be a garden or park or an unused space. And one of the most beautiful parks in the world, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Yeah. I mean, that's a Band-Aid solution, which I think works for that kind of problem. But uh, when I was working in Hawaii, uh, one of the things that floored me was that um, other cities in America were putting their homeless on planes with a one-way ticket mm -hmm. and flying them to Hawaii which I thought was absolutely outrageous. But the, 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 the reasoning behind it was if they're going to live on the street in New York City or somewhere where they could freeze to death, where it's violent, where there's crime, why not put them in paradise where being outside's not so bad? That was, that was the rationale. But what my, my feeling here was that it was actually not solving the problem. No, it's just kicking we it down the road. Keep kicking it. And we, can, we do that in a lot of things. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about agriculture and certainly uh, food, but working at the seaport, you know, 80% of, of what we were doing there was hospitality and food. And so I got a great education on, on the supply chain of food and certainly on, on the ideas and challenges with creating sustainable um, menus and certainly creating sustainable food. Uh, it's not easy to do. Everyone has the aspiration to do, to do it. But politics, cost, and short-term thinking get in the way all the time. And so that is our greatest challenge. And you, you said this before, but uh, America has a very polarizing left and right political system. Yeah. One that I've never never experienced in my... Because we have a very moderate... Yeah, you know, it's quite a moderate place, Australia. It does have left and right views, but it's, it's relatively a moderate culture where you can meet in the middle and agree, uh, even to coalition government. Um, but I've never seen anything like it here. And I think it gets in the way of decisions. It gets in the way of making good decisions around all things sustainability, but also all things experience for humans. It's too, it's too polarising, <laughs> so you can't get anywhere easily. Well, I, I have one of many 
uh, ideas as to why that might be the case in Australia. But one of them is there mandatory voting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, here we polarize voting even and we say, oh, well, we, we want to gerrymander how people vote and prevent them from voting and make it harder to vote and have to show your ID and uh, proof of where you live. And uh, it just you gets... can't do it online and it has to be in person. And there's a whole raft of parameters. It is, it no. is, it is challenging. Yeah. I'm actually becoming an American at the end of the year because I really want to vote. <laughs> I've been here for 10 years, but everyone's vote counts. I mean, you know, placemaking at its core is about focusing on the human dimensions of any neighbourhood, city or town. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the only people usually left out of the process of making new developments are the end users. Everyone's <laughs> running around designing but no one's talking to the most important people, which are the people that actually will generate the community and hand it over and be the custodians of that place long after we all leave, right? So yeah, here, here. we often, we often as Iroko, become the sound and the voice of that end user, the persona and the person. It's a really important role. It's one that I really um, cherish, and it's one that I will often lose a client for. I'll stand up for the human before I stand up for the client. Well. Usually. And my feeling is so so you should. Mm. Um, let's let's think about this for a minute though, as it relates to food and cities and procurement of food, because often when we talk about building sustainable communities, it becomes untenable to really think about a city um, being its own source for its food. Yeah. Everything is trucked in from seemingly far away. Mm. Um, we want to have apples twenty four. Seven. We yes. want to have access to grains at all times. Yeah. We seem to want to have access to things like, you know, sushi and stone fruits whenever we feel like them. Anytime. And so yeah. mm -hmm. how do we create what would be a more regionalized food system that can sustain these cities? And, and what do you see on the horizon for fruit, food procurement mm -hmm. in um, the modern era? Ch challenge, very, very big challenge. I mean, the, the thing that bothers me slightly is how much food gets imported into America. You know, 20% of its food is coming from outside of the country. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it, and agriculture, I think, uses 70% of all fresh water. Fresh water. So it, what we've got is a huge, um, sort of very conservative agriculture. Um, my, my greatest concern for food was that when we had the pandemic, one, one of the things I thought was really eye-opening about the pandemic is that everyone became very... Um, aware of how fragile the supply chain is, right? When all the shelves emptied out, the stress that caused everyone was really heightened because we're not in control. We're not in control. Corporations are in control of how we live. We've got to get back to thinking about how we get in control of our food. I think the, the rule of thumb is that anything that travels more than 400 miles is considered an import. Um, anything under 400 miles is considered local. I think the challenge for food is that when you think about an under 400 mile delivery, it discounts a lot of things that you get very acclimatized to. Grains, rice, imported beers, wines, lots of things that you just consume every day that you take for granted if you wanted to go local. And what I'm getting at here is it's not just the responsibility of governments and corporations, it's a behavioral change with people. If you decided to eat locally, then you wouldn't go to the supermarket. You wouldn't be buying things that are imported from across the country on trucks and planes. You'd be thinking about your own responsibility. So on one hand, it's definitely the responsibility of governments to change the way food supply works for us so we can get that seasonality. We don't have to rely on imports. Um, but on the other hand, I think the greatest challenge is culture, which is how do you change everyone's behaviour? The, the beauty of all this is that young people are conscious. It's the conscious generation. They're coming through with a lot more of a conscious idea about the planet that we, than we ever had. I think we had newspapers <laughs> that, that came out once a week. Young people are up to date on world happenings by the minute and they're demanding the kinds of change that I think that we never could. Um, so I think that's a really great thing for the, for things like food. I mean, quality of food, the quality of fresh water, the quality and access to should be everyone's right, but it's not.
So let's look at rice as just a for example. Rice feeds many people around the globe. Every culture uses rice, whether it be risotto in Italy or paella in Spain or just your sushi and rice at a Japanese restaurant. I mean, it's something that we all consume. Mm. Um, rice, 80% of the rice that's grown in the United States is grown in California. Yeah. In so months. where, let's say, let's take New York as the example because you're from there. You go to a local farmer's market what food are you able to get on a regular basis? Oh, it, well, look, I'm upstate at the, at the moment, so I'm going to use this as an example. There's nothing we can't eat here. I mean, the reality is if you get used to certain foods, rice being one, right, and you think you need it, you actually don't. What you, you, it's what you're accustomed to. It's what you're groomed on. And I think essentially it's same, the same would be true of us developing stone fruits here which are amazing there's a great running joke about the stone fruits of upstate of upstate new york we become obsessed by them over a three-month period and we do export them um, but it's what's in our backyard you know i mean what's being developed in california is for export and money it's not to, not to service california it's to service the country and it's to actually make sure everyone has rice i mean i i think in our role as placemakers one of the things that we look at is behavior Culture and behaviour is core and key to developing great res resilient cities over time. You know, and you I think talk that, about Hawaii too. Like Hawaii, you go to Hawaii, almost everything's trucked in. So, what would you eat on Hawaii? Yeah, that Hawaii is challenging. Not, 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 not almost everything. Everything is chucked in, including building materials. It's an island, so they have to ship yeah. everything. Right. And I think, you know, we struggle with that a little bit, even in, in development, because we had to import it's it's we have to import everything, which is very, very challenging. I will say, though, that there is a different culture in Hawaii. There's a cultural understanding and respect of the land that I don't think exists in other parts of the U.S. So, you know, if you think about the structure of, say, um, Oahu, they set up in the king the kingdoms before we invaded it. <laughs> the kingdoms separated the island into aupuahas. They're these little tiny kind of triangles from the mountain to the sea, and every 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 leader got access to everything: water, vegetation, housing. Everything was in that one triangle, and that's the way they survived. And like they the slices of a pie, basically. A pie. They all got access to elevation, which meant they got water from rain or whatever. It was democratized, um, and and it was almost like a commun communist a commune, which is you know how those tribes often lived, and it's how that island survived for thousands of years. We came in and changed all that. Like we, we came in and and did what us Westerners like to do, which was we monopolized, we moved people out, we changed the infrastructure, we changed the food supply. They weren't importing grains <laughs> before we got there. There's plenty of food. They're surrounded by food. Uh, it's it's just, again, culturally, I think, I mean, a question for you is that you, you're talking to people all day about these things. And I think everyone has a solution, but the greatest challenge technically is changing the culture of the way we live because we, we're, just, we're just accustomed now globally to everything. You know, the industrial revolutions have happened over the last 300 years have happened for a reason. They're there for progress. Right? And in the last 50 years, it's happened. So the Industrial Revolution's happened over 100, 100 year periods. Right? We had um, get to steam and steam, uh, then we had electricity, and of yeah. course we have digital, and now we have AI and a whole new Industrial Revolution happening. I think we how, have Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's. <laughs> and we have that. So globalization meant that everyone now wants everything, and you mm -hmm. have access. There was a time where you could travel to Italy and be surprised, surprised by the taste, by the food, by the types of content. Now when you travel around the world, you've seen it all. You've either seen it in here or you've, you've bought it online and it's come mm -hmm. to the front door or you've accessed it in some way. And so the pleasure of travel has disappeared slightly. It's become more about exploring topography and culture, less about the content. And, or and it's become some kitsch uh, additional thing you do, like going to a luau on Hawaii and yeah. having poi once, you know? Yeah, terrible. I mean, these are the, and this is the, I think, you know, 
um, I think 50% of Americans have passport, less than 50% have a passport, something, some terrible number. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite insular for that reason. Um, and you think with that kind of culture, they get very strong at understanding how to create resil resiliency within, within the country. Um, so it sounds to me like what you're arguing for is that we get to a more regionally based idea of what our food should be and start consuming food with seasonality as well. Yes. So that yeah. we're not just relying on the imported bananas and we're not just relying on rice from China or from California, if you're in New York, to, to work with something else, the, the, to use we, something else. We tried, look, we tried at Seaport when I was working yeah. on that to develop a thing called the 100 Mile Cafe which was everything inside the cafe could only come within 100 miles. When you start looking at that as a proposition, you run out of options very quickly about what you can do. You realise very quickly how limited New York has access to fresh food. So the concept of waterless farming or vertical farming or the idea of farming within the cities is going to help with that kind of regenerative culture where you're less energy to get the food out is the idea. And I think, you know, we talked last time about the concept of what regenerative farming does. Well, regenerative, regenerative farming really is about really less energy and better care to get better product. I mean, that's essentially what it's doing. Um, and I think, you know, we've not had an era where there's been a conscious culture to really push that until now. Yeah. And well, when I asked Paul Hawken about vertical farming as a, for example, yeah. he brought up the case of a, um, an individual in Singapore that was working to say they wanted to go purely regenerative and really have all of their food sourced from within, you know, the area of Singapore. And of course there you have an immensely tight, densely populated area and not a lot of land to farm upon. And they were leaning on this idea of vertical farming. And he said, I think it's a lovely idea, but it won't work. And the reason is that, you know, all the food that you're used to consuming doesn't grow well in vertical farming. And he referenced the grains and things like that. So yeah. I think there's a practical application of this too, because we can't necessarily survive and thrive very well on tomatoes, basil, microgreens, et cetera. So how do we get over that piece? Um, if we're talking about these densely populated areas and, you know, perhaps this hydroponic style, you know, vertical farming option isn't best for some of these foods that we need to grow. Maybe we're, I don't know what's, why that, if I'm getting messages, even though I've got it off. Sorry about that. Um, I don't understand actually why that couldn't work. And I still think about this, which is regenerative farming isn't just about, um, you know, bringing the food closer to, to humans. It's about quality of soil. It's mm -hmm. about biodiversity. It's about making sure that you're reducing the amount of chemicals that gets used. It's about soil health. There's lots of things that go into regenerative farming. The vertical farming concept, I think, works well for a waterless farm. And there are plenty of foods that grow in, in waterless farms that you can actually use for communities all the time. It's like a great central community garden that's in the city. Um, I think we try and boil the ocean a bit, Corinna. You know, you've got one hand, you on, on the you've got one hand, someone screaming on the left, mm -hmm. like Greta Thunberg trying to create action, and on the right, you've got a very old, stodgy government who are moving at the pace of a whale. Where's the <laughs> or a snail? Or a snail. <laughs> I don't what? know. I think about whales as somewhat fast, and maybe that's just me, but no, well, maybe they are snails, you're right. But where where's the moderate conversation? And ultimately, mm -hmm. where are the people in government who are who are supportive in power? That, that's essentially what's happening. And again, I'm a huge proponent of making sure that with all the technology we have, it's everyone's responsibility, everyone, to shift the culture of how we think. And again, if we're trying to do everything in black and white, we won't succeed. It's way right. too grey. It's way too grey. And so where I think you have trouble in the US is that you've got a bi bipolar left and right <laughs> Political argument. <laughs> That's a and kind way of putting it. It's just a little mentally disturbed, right? It's psychopathic, but I think bipolar is <laughs> neater. Um, watching it play out, the culture wars, the idea of, of it means that there are barriers to really good moderate thinking that are getting in the way of achieving anything. And, and a lot of it's propaganda too. Like we're, 
we're working a lot in, in Saudi Arabia right now. And, you know, when I read about Saudi from an American perspective, I get a very strange view of the country. When you're there, the innovation that's happening in that country on the concept of regenerative agriculture, because they're lacking in rain, they're lacking in, in um, tropical fruits, things like that, they have this incredible biodiversity that they're pushing through every channel of their country, more innovative than that than is happening here, much more innovative, innovative than here. They do have some humanitarian um, issues happening in the country, but we're having them here. We're having them here. We have them around the globe, yes. We're around I the mean, globe. Yeah, the reality is that, you know, we we are probably never going to get through all of them. <laughs> No, never. you know, to create the utopia that your I might not, not we might like to live within, we might even think it's attainable. Um, the reality is, it's it seems to be part and parcel to being human to want some level of conflict, and so. <laughs> Well, 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 yes, conflict's part of, of course, it's part of every culture. I guess the difference is, you'd think after millennia, uh, several millennia, we'd be smarter. You, you would think that would be the case, but in reality we do some crazy things. I mean, we do crazy things out of politics and we don't put the people first. I read somewhere yesterday, yesterday I was looking at cities around the globe, um, Jakarta is sinking, right? Jakarta is sinking into the ground. And, you know, they're actually thinking of building a whole new Jakarta 30 kilometres down the road, just abandoning the city they've got and building one down the road. Why? That's poorly, been done many times before. Poorly planned. <laughs> no infrastructure, no plan, no 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 concept of um, you know uh, helping make people's lives better. Just day to day thrashing living with no constraint and actually untethered development. Development just going unnoticed. It's sort of a crazy time in the world where we have an opportunity, I think, to pause a little bit with the right level of conversation to make dramatic changes to how we do everything. Agriculture is one, food consumption, of course, culture is everything. And again, the way we develop, I think we've developed a certain way, cities and neighbourhoods for about 100 years, it hasn't changed. And developers have been struck by the changes in rituals that people now have in how they want to live their lives, because it's very different today. And they, they don't know what to do. <laughs> they're, in, they're in a state of shock about what do I do with commercial offices? What do I do with residences? No one wants to buy anything. Interest rates, affordability. Everyone's at a state of what do we do next when the world's at this level of, of change? And I think what we have to do is take stock and just re wind it back a little bit and say these are good changes. These are positive lifestyle changes people are making. Let's change the way we design for them. Let's change the way we think about neighbourhoods and cities. Once we get that conversation right, everything will be great. But we're not getting so there. Let's talk about where in a city we grow food. Yeah. Where should we be growing food in a city? Well, I think, you know, um, public realm, of course, where, where communities can access and, and actually cultivate their own food. You know, the idea of locked buildings run by corporations, I don't think feels right. So for me, I think it's it's got to be a community decision. But in, in essence, there are different types of agriculture. There's waterless agriculture where you can grow vegetables, lettuce, fry, uh, lettuce uh, vegetables, right? Um, there's, of course, uh, fish farming on, on lots of rooftops around Tokyo in central business district. Fish farming is easy to do. With some level of care, of course, we don't want to sort of overfeed fish and produce <laughs> and mass produce the same problem in the city. Um, obviously, animal care is, is is a huge part of what regenerative agriculture is. You mentioned in your, in your last email to me this idea around the difference between, say, a vegan option, a non-meat option, those types of conversations. I think they're very odd conversations to have because everyone is thinking about that's the way to create more sustainable food. Well, that's just preference and choices at, at this stage because sometimes the vegan option is not the great option for the planet. Sometimes... Well, we talk about an impossible burger and... 
the carbon yeah. footprint of that of product that. alone is relatively packaging and plastic. Packaging and plastic. I mean, think about this. Yeah. When our parents were shopping at the butcher, it came wrapped up in yesterday's newspaper and came home. Now everything is vac sealed and packed and manufactured and shipped off to a supermarket. These are the issues. I mean, in some ways, going, winding things back a little bit actually might be helpful. I think, I think young people are looking for it. Yeah, yeah, younger people, my son's generation, he's 24, 24. He's looking for that kind of life where he can buy fresh food, fresh food, where he can afford it, yeah? where, where he can actually feed his body with things that are not full of chemicals and crap. They have a much bigger conscience than people of our generation. I think that might be the problem. We need more well, of those young people in government. And I'm, I'll try not to take this personally, people of our generation, but, you know, I think about um, some of my favourite times traveling the world and and even just living in a downtown area. I didn't live in a big city because I don't particularly like living in big cities. I like visiting them okay, but to me they're a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But when I lived in downtown Santa Cruz, which is a smaller community, you're talking, you know, 60,000 people, not a huge territory, right? Homeless problem, we've got our issues too, right? But I would walk down the street to the local taqueria to get my taco at, in the evening, wrapped in paper, right? And then I would go to the grocery store and buy fresh produce for that day or maybe the two days that follow. And, you know, some local produce at the farmer's market. I didn't cook enough or eat enough to actually subscribe to a CSA, but there are some locally but available to me too that are regeneratively or organically grown. Mm -hmm. There's even a homeless garden project where they've set aside a chunk of land and homeless people are able to farm the land for their own food, which I think is also an incredible program. Yeah. And then they sell surplus to the community. And so we've got some of these things kind of hard baked into this, what is more of a utopian way of living. Yet most people don't walk to the grocery store. They get in their car even to drive the two blocks because it's become just how we do things. In or worse, country. they order it to their front door. I mean, the thing that I that struck me about America that I'd never seen before in Australia, and I think it's probably worse now in Australia, but back then, 10 years ago, um, if I wanted a screwdriver, I just ring someone and it comes to my front door. If I needed something, it could come to my front door. And you get into this terrible habit very quickly of convenience where you just accept that you can do that. We put a stop to that. <laughs> in our household there was a bit well, of a, it's the amazon culture that's amazon what you're culture. describing we, we mm -hmm. had a moment about five years ago which was eye-opening i got home from work late and uh i was sitting i sat down the doorbell rang spencer went to the door and got his dinner the doorbell rang josh went to the door and got his dinner and then the doorbell rang and jane ordered something for us this this was a spine tingling moment about six years ago where we just went what what has happened here? We can now have anything we want at any time at the click of a button, and we don't. And you're not even eating as a family anymore. We're not eating as a family, so there's not even a community part to it. Your your and your analogy or your the idea of walking down the street, grabbing a taco, it's a community activation. You're actually out with other people seeing other humans interacting you're not sitting at home having it sent to you there's an isolation that happens with that and again that's why my earlier comment about we have a cultural problem where we've got very used to the industrial re revolution that's happened to enable us is to sit at home have everything come to us and that's changing culturally how we feel about each other why is mental health so high at the moment especially in young in young boys um it's triple x in the last 10 years as opposed to the last 30 it's because there are everyone's isolated everyone's sitting mm -hmm. in here everyone's sitting at home and that's got nothing to do with food but all to do with food on the basis that if the access like that is only through here you're not aware of where your food comes from who cooked it where what establishment the personality of the human or even if they care about the environment it's just coming to your door anonymously i think part of this is getting out and actually seeing and talking to the chef and talking to the to the hosts and understanding their philosophy on food having a desire 
to keep them accountable is where we should be. And But we're not. <laughs> we're living in this isolated, all-consuming order fest that I think is destroying community, but also destroying the way we live. And food will suffer from it, hmm. I think. Well, I feel like it already has. You know, mm -hmm. I um, began travelling. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. But we can change it. I mean, that's the whole point here is with the awareness of, hey, try walking to your point. Try walking down the street and talking to someone. Go out into the community. If we change the culture from the order system to being out in the community, things will change. And we need to start. Well, and what more? It can do something for your waistline. We get used to being more sedentary, you know. Yeah. I mean, I walked everywhere. There wasn't a need to hop in my car. And believe me, I enjoy driving. I had a little Mazda Miata at that time that I would zip around with the top down, you know. Yeah. Um, but, hey, having the ability to park the car, not worry about reparking, not worry about door dings or anything to my beautiful little sprightly being of a vehicle, mm -hmm. I could go to a grocery store that was walking distance to my door. I could actually choose produce that was grown locally at the grocery store. So if I couldn't make it to the farmer's market, it was there and it had yeah. a prominent placard saying locally grown, locally sourced, things mm -hmm. like that. And within 25 miles. So it wasn't like it was coming from yeah. far, far away. Now, granted, I'm in Santa Cruz area. We have a lot of farming locally. If you get an artichoke in a grocery store where you are anywhere in the United States, it probably came from here. Came from you. Yeah. Right. Um, in addition to berries, you, I, on Hawaii, I think it's a travesty, but Driscoll's, b blackberries, blueberries, yeah. you know, all their berries are there on Hawaii. And yet, you know, you'll see this plethora of local fruits oh. that are spoiling because someone's buying, you yeah. know, a little crate of blackberries for $8. We have, <laughs> and, we haven't, and we haven't even touched on waste, have we? I mean, the concept of waste, the concept mm -hmm. of supermarkets picking the right fruit to be served and all the slightly damaged fruit being thrown is a travesty. So we, we, we do have a, an issue with consumption that, that I think is, again, at the core of culture. Um, but it happens on both sides. I think we need industry to change the way they think about regenerative agriculture and food and we need culturally to change the way we think about consuming it or, or purchasing it. I think if those two things can come together, We'll have a great moderate plan, but we don't. We have this polarizing political system that doesn't allow it to join. So I think, you know, the big debate that we'll happen over the next 10 years is can we actually bridge the gap between the voice of a generation saying it's time for change and a political system that's out of touch? I and think, the behaviors that we need to shift along yeah, the way as well. Definitely. So um, before we pivot further, um, you mentioned something that I think is critical that we talk about, you know, there are many people in the climate space that, you know, trend towards vegetarian, I almost said vegetarian, what is that? It's but vegetarian, vegetarian or plant-based mm -hmm. who are trying to get less of their food from animals, mm -hmm. even if they are um, not a vegetarian, they might call themselves a flexitarian, um, mindful choices around the meats that they're consuming. But most of what Americans consume and in developed countries around the globe, especially if you're talking about those, you know, fast food joints that are so popular, are using animal foods that have been grown in concentrated animal farming operations or CAFOS. Um, and these CAFOS operations are, of course, you know, everything's about the dollar and not so much about animal husbandry. Um, they aren't beautiful no. living conditions and no, treatment awful. of the animals is kind of brutal, yeah. generally speaking. So so how do we take this into this story and, and build it into part of that shift so that we can be creating both enough food to feed humanity and doing so more mindfully and more regionally? Yeah. Like how do you see this coming into play? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you sent me that note, <laughs> I went researching it because I actually wanted to get a bit more of an understanding about um, the scale of the industry, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think the issue that we're going to face is that, again, the shifting culture, um, living, off, living off plants is not a new idea. People have been doing it for a long time. Um, the issue here is that you have a stigma, you have a stigma in this sort of false idea that you need the meat to survive or it's just part of what your diet is. So, again, you, you, you have that stigma. My, my feeling is 
there are better methods of re regenerative agriculture in feeding animals <laughs> that don't we don't need the horrible um, you know lines lines and lines of dairy cows or lines and lines and lines of cows feeding our troughs in mud pits with a really poor quality of life that 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 again i mean without keep repeating myself i think we detach from those things we're completely mm -hmm. detached and so and so when you bring it to people's attention and they are conscious of the problem then things change I would I would say though you've got a couple of things happening. One, on one hand, the vegans are thinking about two things. They're either thinking about the the animal, right? So there's a view that the yeah, ethical vegan, the ethical yeah, absolutely. Vegan. Mm -hmm. You've then got the health conscious vegan that believes that plant based is better for their diet, and not always, by the way, but but better for their diet. And then you have a vegetarian that's trying to sort of do a bit of both. You know, some animal products, but but fundamentally uh, fruit and veg. I think. I think if you can replicate meat ethically, if you can replicate meat to be sustainable, the Impossible Burger, for example, if that all comes the right, to fruition the right way and is sustainable, it will probably remove the need for any kind of farming that's like that. I mean, but we're not there, right? So that's yeah. the problem. The problem is that's a long journey. But I suspect with the innovation that's happening now and the research that you can get your fillet steak and it won't be fillet steak. You can get your T-bone and it won't be T-bone. It won't be an animal. It will be some other type of product that's either better for you and better for the planet, but it's not ready, right? It, but yeah. it's coming. I mean, that's the exciting well, part of where we are in the world is that the innovation that's happening is coming, but it's not coming fast enough for, yeah. for most people. You know, I'm a lover of sushi. I love sashimi, yeah. right? I love fish, but I stopped consuming it several months ago because I don't believe that our fishing operations around the globe are truly sustainable. And I spent enough time talking about it that I felt like I was a um, hypocrite. Hypocrites. <laughs> yeah. I, I won, you know, I, I wanted to write a book called Accidental Hypocrite for this yeah. and many other reasons. Um, probably would end up getting sued, sued by Ann Tyler, who wrote, you know, like Accidental it. Tourist and an yeah. Accidental Everything, right? But, um, I I really had this sense that I just needed to stop consuming fish unless I knew exactly where it came from and I understood that to be sustainable. So there might be, you know, a situation where I consume fish but it's become a rarity. Yeah. Well, at Expo West 2023, which is in Anaheim every March, I sampled some vegan sashimi and, and? it literally looked like and tasted like fish. Um, the texture was a little bit more like lox than right. the density yeah. that you expect from yeah. something else, right? Yeah. But it was still passable. Yeah. Um, there were even vegan eggs, but they were packaged in a ton of plastic and I would never touch it, right? right. So there's, you know, some things I think are coming out of food tech that are quite interesting, but whether or not they have the same nutrition power is really yeah. the question. Like, is it just a bunch of filler that's, you know, guar gum or whatever that are, right. are isn't really going to nourish our bodies mm. or is it a solution that will provide the kind of nutrition and micronutrients and macronutrients that our bodies need to thrive? Your, so, your, your point's well taken is that, is that your, what you're saying, which I agree with is, which is you've got capitalism at play. Mm -hmm. in veganism where they're where they're manufacturing replicas to make a lot of money and they don't particularly care about the packaging they don't particularly care about the content as long as it's possible they're that getting is, tons of money funding you know like air is, protein there's even a company making protein from microbes in the air right so so th so this is the this is the issue are we going to go out of one frying pan into the fire are we going to go from we know the problem, how do we fix it? And then capitalism gets in the way. And actually, before you know it, we're producing more carbon. We're not sinking mm -hmm. it. We're not sequestering it into the soil. It's, we're releasing it into the... Into because we're manufacturing, we're creating a manufacturing solution. And I think that is that is a great concern. Um, uh, Russell Fortmeyer, who's our head of sustainability uh, at our business, is a huge proponent of these massive changes. The idea of change in culture and the idea of really um, ensuring that we don't let any innovation go unchecked. You know, we don't just accept every innovation as the right thing because there's a lot of 
mistrust also happening in that territory. And so it has to be regulated. Now, I think that's what the government is kind of working out. How do you regulate these changes so we get the right pro product, the right quality of everything? Um, when we design, look, when we actually design places and when we look at placemaking as a, as a, philo a philosophy, um, our name, ERA, is an acronym. It's evidence, making sure that we have the research. We don't just jump into response, which is our second mm -hmm. letter. We, our, our responses need to be measured by the evidence. And I think way too many people are inventing without doing the research properly, right? And, that, and that's a worry because then you say, well, now we're just inventing and who knows if it's right? <laughs> who knows if it's right? Or, it's you're, you know, this is the short-sighted piece that you referenced at the beginning of this whole conversation. We're creating short a, a short-term solution, but we don't know what the long-term effect is going to be. Right. That's right. And then action. You know, the, the last piece of our name is, is action because I think there's a lot of dusty documents with great research and good ideas sitting them with no one actioning anything. I know that's probably political more than anything, but ERA is about evidence, response and action. You can't have great research and good ideas and not action them. Or you can't just action something with an idea with no evidence. So for me, that triptych culturally has to get into government or has to get into, into community groups, for example, who need the information. I mean, that's the key. Wow. Well, to close to this portion of our conversation, I've constructed a few speed round questions for you, oh. and then we'll pick back up and talk more deeply about the build of these communities, how people can even kind of picture them in their minds and drive forward into that conversation as a, as a big solution for the future development of our oh. societies. So before we get there, here's my speed round. Sure. Would you define yourself as a pessimist or an optimist? An optimist, definitely an optimist. So as an optimist, Mm -hmm. What concerns you most and what gives you the most hope? Uh, I think what concerns me the most is our city's resiliency. I don't know if they're resilient and they are breaking under the pressure of, of, of change. But what, gives me hope, but what gives me hope is young people. Mm -hmm. I, I find I'm actually wildly impressed with what's happening with people under 25. I put myself back to under 25. I didn't have the same level of commitment to the planet that they do. It's an awareness thing, of course, through social media, but I'm completely floored by how committed young people are to getting things to change. That gives me great hope. As a that gives me great hope too. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. Okay. And um, I just want to go ahead and, and remind all of our listeners, we will have a part two coming out next week where we dive more deeply with Stephen Cornwell and learn more about Erico. Now, as we might have mentioned already, to connect with Stephen's important work at Erico, visit era-co.com. Do you like them to go anywhere else in particular, your social channels? Which are your most active uh, link, on? Uh, li LinkedIn or um, even direct. I take a direct email as well. But um, our website has uh, all my information on it. That's fantastic. Great. It was fantastic talking to you. Great job. Awesome. As always, you can visit our show notes on your favorite podcasting platform to find the direct links to contact Stephen, visit their LinkedIn page, and learn more about Erico. I encourage you to visit caremorebebetter.com for our complete transcripts to this episode, as well as additional resources. Not only will you find direct links to past episodes and resources that we touched on in today's episode, you could also sign up for our newsletter. And as a welcome gift to doing so, you'll receive a five-step guide that will help you organize your efforts, unleash your potential, and inspire your activism. While you visit, I hope that you'll follow the links to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts like the one I read earlier today. And if you don't like what I'm doing here, you can always reach out to me personally and give me that critical bump as well. I want to hear from you, good or bad. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm doing this show to support you and help your learning efforts as well. So if you have a particular topic that you'd like to see us dive more into, I hope that you'll share it with us. Now, like I said at the top of the show, I do read every single review, and each of them makes this effort worth it. 
Thank you listeners now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even transform our food systems and build a better future together. One in which people are nourished and fulfilled. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good. 